Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we welcome Mark McCorkran, Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency to the show. We're going to talk about the ESA's Beppe Colombo mission to Mercury. We're also going to look at Comet Leonard as it makes its closest approach to Earth this week, and we'll tell you how to find it in the night sky. We're going to hear about an odd finding from a Chinese lunar rover on the far side of the moon, and we look forward to the launch of the most advanced telescope ever sent to space, the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, Comet Leonard's going to be visible to amateur astronomers this week throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Although this comet's not going to be bright enough to be seen with the naked eye, this dirty snowball in space made its closest approach to Earth on the 12th of December. Comet Leonard can be found near Venus on the night of Tuesday, 14th of December, using a pair of binoculars. Now, head out just after sunset on Tuesday night to an area with a clear view low to the southwest. There, you're going to see Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus forming a line of bright planets in the sky. Keep following that downward and turn just a little bit to your right just before reaching the horizon. That fuzzy spot you see in your binoculars is Comet Leonard. Or maybe it's just a stain on your lenses. I don't know. I can't bury spots before cleaning your binoculars. Have fun viewing and remember it's going to be cold out there even in places like Tucson, so stay warm. The U-22 lunar rover on the far side of the moon has spotted something unusual on the horizon. New images show what appears to be a cube-shaped object inside the Von Karman crater in which it landed nearly three years ago. Dubbed the Mystery Hut, this feature sits at the edge of a small crater 80 meters or 260 feet away from the craft. The Chinese Space Agency CNSA is directing the rover to explore the mystery object, but these rovers travel slowly, so it's going to take two to three months to arrive. The James Webb Space Telescope, the most advanced space-borne telescope ever developed, is readying for launch on the 22nd of December. This telescope, featuring a massive segmented mirror, will view the sky in visible and infrared light, allowing unprecedented views of much of the cosmos. The James Webb Space Telescope will give astronomers glimpses of our universe 13 billion years ago, as well as worlds in our own family of planets today. Instruments on board the James Webb Space Telescope also potentially have the capability of finding life on other worlds. Join us on the 21st of November for our season finale, looking at this revolutionary instrument. We're going to be talking with Dr. Stephanie Milam, Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science for the James Webb Space Telescope at the Goddard Space Flight Center about this remarkable, remarkable craft. Now looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. 
and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Mark McCorcoran about the latest and most advanced mission ever to explore Mercury, Pepe Colombo. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by Mark McCorcoran. He is Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration for the European Space Agency, and he's here to talk to us about the Beppe Colombo mission to Mercury. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much, James. Good to be here. Yeah. So for those who may not know, what can you give us a brief rundown of what is Beppe Colombo and what makes it such a fascinating mission? Beppe Colombo is a collaborative mission between the European Space Agency, who I work for, and the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, uh, JAXA. So it's an international mission um, comprising two science spacecraft traveling to Mercury together in a stack. Uh, and beneath them is a propulsion module. So actually there's a rather big stack of six and a half meters high of spacecraft traveling together. Uh, they were launched in October 2018 uh, from our launch site in French Guiana on an Ariane 5. And they've got a very complicated journey to get to Mercury, which we can talk about in a couple of minutes. So even though you can get to Mercury quite quickly, uh, just in a few months, uh, it's not that far away from us, closer to the sun, of course, than we are. Um, it, if you just went straight there, you'd fly straight past it um, and you wouldn't be able to go into orbit. So we've taken a journey, which we can discuss, which is actually seven years long, a very complicated journey. So we can go into orbit uh, around Mercury at the end of 2025. It's fascinating. I definitely do want to talk about its, its, its interesting little journey it's going to be taking there. But first, you know, I'd like to discuss that Mercury has so far only been explored up close by Mariner 10, 1974 and 75, and Messenger, which orbited uh, Mercury from 2011 to 2015. Um, so why is it? So this is only going to be our third mission to Mercury. What, what, why is that? Why is this not a better explored planet? Well, again, it's this business of being close to the sun. So actually, most people uh, have never even seen Mercury. Um, it lives in the inner solar system, roughly a third of the distance away from the sun that the Earth is. Uh, and that means that it's always close to the sun in the sky, if that makes sense. When you look up into the sky, Bepi Colo uh, Mercury can never be very far away from the sun. Uh, so that most people haven't seen it. You either have to see it in, under good conditions just after sunset or just before sunrise. Uh, and it's a relatively small planet as well, so it's it's not sort of shining super brightly. It's quite dark. So unlike Venus, which is very reflective and a much bigger planet and closer, uh, that's quite bright. But Mercury's relatively faint, so it's harder to see. But therein lies the problem. The problem is that when you go that close to the sun, you're being pulled in by the sun's gravity. Um, and so journeying down into the gravity well of the sun, you have to slow down. You have to lose energy uh, in order to be able to get into orbit around Mercury. As I said before, you just fly past it otherwise. And in fact, it takes more energy in your maneuvers to get to Mercury than it does to get to Pluto. So more energy is required for Bepi Colombo, more energy exchange, if you like, what we call delta V, change of velocity. We need more of that for Bepi Colombo than you needed for New Horizons, which is quite remarkable. That is, that is pretty amazing when you think about it. And so you are going on this journey which um, goes around different planets. We'd be able to do just a little bit about its journey there and what science you may be able to pull off while this thing is, is headed to its main target. Yeah, so we launched, as I said, in October 2018, and just over a year later, we came back to Earth again. So it's sort of one of those weird things. You thought, well, sorry, we went somewhere else, but no, we came back to Earth and we did a flyby. And these flybys exchange energy between the spacecraft 
and the planet. So effectively, by borrowing a little bit or of the energy of Earth, you could give it to Bepi Colombo, or in this case, actually the other way around, you took some energy away from Bepi Colombo and gave it to the Earth. And that allowed Bepi Colombo then to head towards Venus and it had two flybys at Venus, the most recent one being in uh, August this year. And the same process again, you use Venus to break you and slow you down. Now, I should say that in between these flybys, we also have a very innovative uh, propulsion system on board. Okay. Not a rocket, but what we call an ion engine. So this is uh, four um, sort of big uh, engines on the back end, which send out the stripped ions of xenon. So the gas xenon, the noble gas, you rip the electrons off it and then you accelerate the, the positive ion through a series of grids up to very high speed and shoot them out of the back. And that provides propulsion as well. Now, the weird thing about that, it's not like a rocket where it's on for seconds or minutes. This, these engines are on for a total of two years during the mission. So they give very little force at any given time, but because they're on for long periods of time, they can change the trajectory. So on board Bepi Colombo, we actually loaded up with 550 kilograms of xenon gas uh, at launch. And xenon, people will be familiar with these days because it's the same kind of gas that's used in these very white headlamps that expensive cars have. So yeah, we, we bought a large fraction of the world's total of xenon production uh, for Bepi Colombo uh, when it was launched. But that again, helps us with the flybys to get to Mercury. So we had these two Venus flybys, the second one in, in August. And then just six weeks later, we arrived at Mercury for the first time. Uh, did our first flyby, got our first pictures of the surface of Mercury, but didn't stop. Flew past it and are now in orbit, roughly in the same orbit as Mercury, but going faster. So in the next, um, between the end at this point in 2021 and to the end of 25, we have another five flybys at Mercury, each time going past. Most of these flybys are very close to the surface, just 200 kilometers above the surface. Uh, so you have to get them right. You have to aim exactly and precisely. And so we're tuning the, the trajectory all the time. You don't want to then be 200 kilometers off. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, I mean, people sort of say, well, how do you, we don't control this in real time, of course, because it's too far away. We, right. We're not joysticking it through these maneuvers, but we have plenty of time as we head towards the planet where we can check where the stars are, where the planet are, tune the trajectory by small amounts. And we're very expert at doing that. We've done that with famously with the Rosetta Comet mission mm -hmm. um, between 2004 and 2016. So we had a lot of practice at this, but every time you've got to get it right. And then very finally, when we get to uh, the, the, the last flyby, and then what happens after that is we're roughly at the right speed to go into orbit around Mercury. So we have a small chemical propulsion, just a regular rocket, if you like, which then gives us that final, final kick. We go into orbit around Mercury, the three spacecraft separate the propulsion module with all the xenon on board. We get, we throw that away. Oh. The, you know, it's a piece of metal, right? I mean, it's, it had a lot of xenon in it and, you know, it's done its job. Um, and then we have the European planetary orbiter, uh, which will go into orbit roughly a few hundred kilometers above the surface of Mercury. And we could talk about that, that incredibly challenging to do that. We can talk about that in a moment. And then the Japanese spacecraft, which is actually mostly designed to study the magnetic field of Mercury, that separates off. And between the two spacecraft, they operate then completely in, separately, but not independently. You can do science between the two spacecraft. So you asked about, you know, what's the mission about? What are the questions? The magnetic field is one of those. Uh, Mercury's small, uh, it's smaller than Mars. Mars has no magnetic field anymore. We believe that's because the core of Mars has frozen and it's not liquid metal anymore like we have in the center of our Earth. So there's no dynamo, there's no rotation between the, the core and the surface, which creates the magnetic field on the Earth. But Mercury has one, so, but it's smaller. It should have frozen just like Mars. Why is that the case? We also now know from Messenger that the magnetic field is offset. It's not actually centered in the middle of Mercury. So that's another mystery. 
And overall, Mercury is a much denser planet than we would expect for something of its size. So we don't really fully understand the origins of Mercury, what happened in the inner solar system four and a half billion years ago that made it this very dense, heavy object that still today in its interior retains a magnetic field. And on the surface, even though it's incredibly hot on Mercury, on the day side of Mercury, it has volatiles like sodium and potassium and calcium, which actually seem to be coming out of the surface uh, in, we wouldn't call them volcanoes, but places where there are volatile materials coming out onto the surface, even today. And then at the poles, we know there's water ice at the poles of Mercury. Uh, and, and again, the, the surface of Mercury is up to 450 degrees Celsius. So the temperature of the inside of a pizza oven. Um, how can there be water there? And we think that's because the poles are completely sheltered. Mercury rotates incredibly upright. Unlike the Earth, which is tilted over at 23 and a half degrees, Mercury is very straight upright. And that means the poles never see sunshine in some craters there. And we think that water might have been delivered by comets or asteroids hitting the surface more recently, and it's somehow being preserved there. So there's loads of mysteries about Mercury, despite what Mariner 10 and Messenger both did. Bepi Colombo has lots of new things to study uh, and we'll be doing it in a different way by getting much closer to the surface much more of the time than Messenger was able to do. Wow. And are you able to do a lot of science on, on during these flybys or um, or is it gonna, science mainly going to have to wait till 2025? There's a, it's a mixture really, um, because we're in the stack where we have what we call the MMO, the Japanese spacecraft, the MPO, the European one, and the MTM, the propulsion module. Many of the instruments are actually sandwiched between the MTM and the MPO. So they're, they're deliberately not um, accessible while the spacecraft's in a stack. And one of the main instruments in there, which, which can't operate in this phase is the main science camera. Now, fortunately, we do have three webcams on board, which were effectively to ensure and oversee the deployments of things like the high gain antenna, which we use to communicate the data back to Earth, the solar panels, uh, and other hardware, the magnetometer boom, for example. So we've been able to use those. They're very simple cameras, just sort of 1024 pixels square, black and white, no filters. So we can just get uh, monochrome images. But some of the science instruments on Bepi Colombo are operational. So some of the ones which me measure magnetic fields, measure plasma, measure particles. So that's the thing about Bepi. It's kind of got two parts to it. One's a, what you call a remote sensing part where you're looking at an object from a distance, Mercury. And some of those instruments aren't operational uh, because of the stacking. And then you have the uh, in situ. So remote is sensing is looking for far in situ is what's around you right now the magnetic field and the particles. And so we are getting results. We had results at Venus and the scientists got their first data at Mercury uh, just a few weeks ago. And I know they're very, you know, very interested in looking at that. We just flew past in, a, you know, in minutes. So it won't be a huge amount of high quality data, but it will allow them to check and calibrate how well the instruments were working at Mercury under these very hot conditions, which we couldn't do at Venus, of course, because it's further away from the sun. It's not quite that hot at Venus. And speaking of which, how is how is Pepe Colombo doing after that passage? Yeah, it seems to be fine. Just uh, a week or so after the flyby, it actually had its closest approach to the sun. So as it flew past Mercury, it went even closer to the sun. And, you know, the, the temperature on the outside of Bepi, it, it gets very high indeed. So you've got the sun on one side, which when you're at that distance away from, from it, just a third of the distance that we are, that makes it roughly 10 times brighter than on the Earth. So at our test center here in the Netherlands, where I work, we actually had to simulate uh, with enormous, great big, um, high intensity halogen lamps and a big mirror, we could actually beam 10 times the solar intensity onto the spacecraft. Uh, and on the other side, when we get into orbit around Mercury, you've got Mercury, the planet at 450 degrees Celsius. So you're being blasted from one side and from the other. Um, and you've got temperatures which are up to 500 degrees uh, Celsius on the on the uh, spacecraft itself. 
So, but obviously computers won't work and instruments don't work at those temperatures. So on the inside, we have to maintain the temperature down around 50 degrees Celsius at the maximum. Now it's quite warm. That's kind of Tucson summer. I was going to say, yeah, it's Tucson summer right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that doesn't quite reach that here in the Netherlands. But, but you've, so that's a huge differential between the outside and the inside. And there are two ways you have to deal with that. One is by having very thick insulation. So Bepi Colombo, unlike most spacecraft, which are typically black when they're launched, um, it actually is very silver and it's got this very um, complicated multi layers of kind of fireman's uh, um, uh, fireproof outfit. Uh, in fact, it, it's, it's a metallized material in the outer layers and that all had to be hand sewn um, onto the spacecraft. And in fact, there's a legendary story that one day somebody came into the, the clean room where Bepi was being kind of stitched up and there, were, there was blood on the floor under the spacecraft. And it's because one of the people who had been stitching the blankets on had poked themselves <laughs> with a big needle. <laughs> Um, so, so obviously, you know, that helps you put your big insulation on, but in the end, you'll just warm up because there's that constant sunlight mercury. If you're, you know, when we're, this is the difference, you know, a messenger would fly close into mercury and then back out to large distances again and in and out and in and out. Bepi Colombo is just going to be in a constant orbit. So it's always going to be seeing this hot, uh, surface of mercury. So the other trick with Bepi is that you've got to get rid of heat and in space you can't use convection uh, because there's no air and you can't really use conduction because what are you conducting it to there's right. just space around you so the only thing you can really shed heat by is through through light through infrared radiation you can beam this the, the, just like a radiator in your room gives out most of its heat through through actually being warm and radiating into the room hence the word but on Bepi, we do, we, we do that. But if you beamed it in the direction of the sun, you'd get way more energy coming back. And if you beamed it to Mercury, exactly the same, way more energy. So the only way the radiators can point is into that narrow piece of space that's not facing the sun and not facing Mercury. So out sideways. So the radiators on Bepi have to point sideways and they constantly have to do that. So as we fly around Mercury, the spacecraft actually has to turn Just, all right, the time right. and that makes Bepi one of the most challenging missions we've ever operated because it's constantly changing its attitude as it goes up. People would think well as you move around um, the, you you end up you know if you move around the earth for example if you think about the Hubble Space Telescope going around the earth if it's pointing at a star up here as you go around it doesn't rotate around the earth and point in different places it just keeps pointing in the same direction okay it doesn't the, the sp spacecraft doesn't spin as you go around the earth with Bepi if we didn't actively m change its orientation all the time then there would be moments when the radiators would actually be facing Mercury or the Sun and that would be totally counterproductive right. <clears throat> so this constant dynamic reorientation of the attitude of the spacecraft has to happen once once we're in orbit we're not doing it at the moment of course because we're not in orbit around mercury but when we get there that's going to be going on all the time and you know so people will be on the edge because if if we one of the computers goes out we have a safe mode we have a, you know we don't have long to recover things before the spacecraft would overheat wow and so finally what's what's next for Pepe colombo Next flyby it, back at Mercury is next summer. So although we had Venus and Mercury very close together, just six weeks apart, the next one is actually, uh, I think, in June or so. I don't have the, the date exactly right, in yeah, my mind. Yeah. And they're not completely equally spaced. So uh, we've got a few where there's a long gap and then a couple come very rapidly. So we, in, in some of them, we go around the kind of around the sun twice before we go back to Mercury and others we go around four times In one. We just go around once. Uh, Mercury has an 80 day orbit, 88 day orbit around the sun. So we, we, we go around pretty quickly, but we don't, we don't just go around once and encounter Mercury. We spin around it a few times. So yeah, we've got a little bit of time now, analyze the data that were taken in the first, uh, flyby. And I was, I, I'm not working on the mission per se, but one thing I do do a lot of at ESA is work with images coming back from our spacecraft. I'm an astronomer, actually. I work on the James Webb Space Telescope, among other things. Uh, but I have a passion for imaging and how our digital detectors return data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I actually helped with 
uh, some of my colleagues in taking the webcam data, what we, the monitoring camera data, and as they flowed back in the morning of the flyby around Mercury, um, we were looking at those and putting them out for, for uh, public consumption and also making a, um, an animation, a time-lapse movie. And we had some of the scientists from BepiColombo, Dave Rothery and others, who've been working on this mission for years and years and years. And we were all online in Zoom watching the images come back and to see the excitement of the scientists who had actually finally seen their destination for the first time. Seeing craters that we know from Messenger, Messenger's got better images so far, but you know, we will have much better data when we separate the spacecraft out. Um, but they're very excited already by, you know, by being there after so many years. And uh, I think that's, yeah. you know, it's a great time for the project and uh, lots to come still. That's great. Thanks so much for being on the show, Mark. It was fabulous talking with you. My pleasure. Anytime. Anytime. And that was Mark Corcoran, a Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration for the European Space Agency. Next week, on the 21st of December, we're going to give you an up-close look at the James Webb Space Telescope as that mission readies to explore the depths of the cosmos. We're going to be talking with Dr. Stephanie Milam, Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science for the Webb Telescope at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Here's a sneak preview of that interview. Uh, so um, the first year of science uh, for solar system with JWST is really exciting. Um, we're going to be doing everything that we possibly can in the solar system. So because of the funny shape of the telescope, we can't point towards the inner solar system. So it's sort of limited to, you know, Mars on out. But we will be doing things like near Earth asteroids, comets, interstellar objects. And one of the most exciting programs that I'm I'm really intrigued about is we're going to be studying some of these ocean worlds. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. Oh boy. TV. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. For more information about space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Dot net. Mm -hmm.